Some of you have probably seen the uh, exhibition outside on collective creativity. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I also, because it seemed very relevant, I, I decided to add a little postscript at the end about um, uh, disruptive innovation, which I think connects to some of the other exhibitions going on today. So um, I'm based in London at the London Institute. I'm also uh, connected to the, to the CNRS in Paris, but mostly I'm, I'm based in London. Um, I'm going to start off with Homer's Iliad. So Homer's Iliad is, um, is the first great uh, Western work of literature. And many of us have this idea of creativity as being the, uh, is coming from the, the lone individual genius. But I want to suggest that there's, a, there's a, a more plausible idea that creativity needs a context and it comes from a social context and it comes from a group. So Homer's Iliad isn't really Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad is, is an oral poem which was passed down over several hundred years uh, at a time when, when writing, committing things to writing, was, was people were less able at that or less likely to do it. So it was passed down orally from person to person, groups of people to groups of people. And along the way, people made edits. They added some passages. They took out some tedium in certain other parts. And what we're left with is the composition of many different people over, over many, uh, many decades, actually several centuries. Now fast forward a few thousand years to Wikipedia. Now I want to suggest Wikipedia is a very similar sort of creative process. Um, this is now uh, the first one. Homer Zelid is the first great Western work of literature. This is the world's most popular reference. And how many of you here have edited Wikipedia? How many of you can recite Homer's Iliad? Okay. Um, so uh, several of you have uh, edited Wikipedia. The idea there is that many people, tens of millions of people, have come together to make edits to this thing. Except Wikipedia converges on the length scale of tens of minutes for its popular articles rather than um, tens of decades for, for Homer's Iliad. Now, We've been interested in trying to understand why is it that a bunch of people, and even more surprising, people who don't know each other, anonymous people, can come together and, and do something creative. So as is, um, seems to be a theme of this meeting, we decided to set up a game. And our game was to get uh, three people to play what we call the anagram game. So the idea is to take these letters, so it's random letters, 28 random letters, chosen with the sort of frequency you would expect in, in English, uh, so like Scrabble frequency. And each player, we have three players, they're given 60 seconds to swap letters around, and the goal is to build an interesting sentence. So this is player A. Okay, he gets 60 seconds. So nothing, nothing, uh, no great genius here. It passes on to player B, and he makes a few changes. It goes to player C, and then it goes back to A. And we cycle through this, each player getting 60 seconds. So you see that often the sorts of changes that, that people make are very, you know, you see rutting in this, the blue rutting here, almost, you can almost see that it's just crying out from the letters above it. So we keep playing this, and certain words stick, certain words are dismantled, and finally, we get, we get to this last sentence where we, people decide to stop. We like this. Idea is American beef soul rotting. Well, I'm, I'm American, and I, I actually think uh, beef is food, food for the brain. But um, they're, they're, this is the sentence they came up with. So here's what's really weird about this game. There are two things weird about it. The first weird thing is that when we have one player play 15 rounds of a minute each, he does, the lone player does worse than multiple players playing for fewer rounds each, but at the total, the total amount of time invested. So on the right, we have three players playing, and on the left, we have one play, player playing 15 turns. Now, it turns out, these are all, all these letters are from the same initial, all these experiments are from the same initial set of letters. Here are some other examples. So the, the, the choice of these initial letters doesn't seem to be that important. People's minds are so sort of uh, various that they quickly go off on their own path. 
The second surprising thing that we've noticed from these experiments is that when you put people in a room and have them play together, they tend to do worse than people who play anonymously online. So being together in a room, collaborating, discussing, seems to be worse when you have no idea what the other person's strategy is. And this, is, this we found very surprising. One of, the things that, one of the things we picked up on is that when people were in the room together, if you're, at, if you're about to destroy my favorite word that I built in my last turn, and we're going to walk out the door together at the end of the experiment, you're a little bit nervous about this sort of social awkwardness of editing something that I've created. Whereas when we're anonymous, you have, you, we don't care about destroying other people's, what we think is we keep their good bits and we, do, and we tear apart their bad bits. So how, how is it that, um, that multiple people without a common strategy, so these people are not cooperating, right? How is it that they can create something uh, potentially more creative, in fact more creative it seems, than, than an individual on his own? So there are three conditions that we've, we've, we hypothesized. The first one is, is constrained freedom. So what do we mean by constrained freedom? Well, it, nowadays we tend to worship this idea of, um, uh, of the idea of infinite choice. And so by infinite choice, if the, these are four blank Scrabble tiles. Well, you can pick any four letter word you want, right? There are up to five, five and a half thousand of them. But if we just give you these four letters and you have to cho choose your word, you're much more constrained, but you're much more likely to, to engage. So constraint and freedom seems to bring in a person's engagement. The second thing that we, we think is important is what, what I call self-refereeing. So most of the time, the psychological motivation for editing a Wikipedia article or open source software or playing this game, I think is fascinating. It's easy to think that people edit stuff because they want to be famous or they want recognition. But when it's anonymous, you don't get either of those. So one thing that um, we've noticed that people tend to, to assess their own expertise at something and then edit or not based on their assessment of their own expertise. So I don't know how much you know about bananas. But if we look at two, the two Wikipedia articles on banana, one from 2002, and this is pretty much all of it, right? Very simple. The other from yesterday, well, most of us probably could and would be happy to, if it was easy enough, to make an edit to the first, to the first entry. But if you saw the second one, you think, well, I'm, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a specialist in plants or fruit. So I think I'm going to leave that to the pros. So we self-referee in a natural way. Another way of thinking about this is, for most of us, it's play to edit the other one. It's work to edit the second one. Because the first one, you instantly have something that you can add. Like, well, they tend to be yellow in North America and Europe, at least. The third condition is this, uh, sounds fancy, scale invariant mutability. What that means, in simple terms, is that you can, you can edit the thing on small scales and big scales with the same amount of ease. So with language, that uh, comes naturally to us with language. That is to say, swapping two letters for us is just as, it takes just as much mental work as swapping two words or swapping two clauses or sentence fragments. In this, the, um, the, the colors get brighter as they go from, from letters to words to clauses to sentence fragments. The same is true of Lego, by the way. It's just as easy as, uh, for us conceptually to snap off a single Lego as it is to snap off a whole component, like a wing of a ship and move it somewhere else. So these three ingredients together, we think, give a basis to the potential for, for collective creativity. Now, here's a, um, a model by which we, we think maybe collective, why do, a model that leads collective creativity to converge. And um, so the idea is that all of us have a different picture. Let's go back to the anagram game. All of us have in our mind a different idea of what makes a good sentence, or a fun sentence, or an interesting sentence. So this could say this corresponds to somebody's mental landscape. And moving that gold ball is making a small change. Now, if it's a downhill move for you, this is what you say, your, your particular landscape, if that's a downhill move for you, it's very easy. But then you're stuck, and it requires work. 
to go uphill and find another solution. But when you pass the game on to someone else who has a slightly different landscape of what makes a good sentence from the letters at hand, well, the same sequence of letters and pass on to my landscape, I now find that just by playing, going downhill, I can make a move. But then I'm stuck and I have to go uphill to continue. And now I'm bored because I have to work and I want to pass it on to someone else. And by this sequence of downhill moves, as we pass it along, we're able to get deeper and deeper in a better and better solution. So what this highlights is the importance of at least some anonymity. If our landscapes are too close, we don't actually, we're not thrown into different minima so that we can explore the landscape. We've tried this out, as some of you may have seen, also on, um, on anonymous mosaic collaboration. So you're given uh, 16 by 16 gray tiles, and you can swap, uh, you, you can make tiles uh, different shades of gray. And when we had people play this anonymously, they came up, uh, this is one of the sequences they came up with. In, in this case, they each had five minute turns to edit. And one thing to keep in mind here is that this is very much play for these people. They were goofing off, they were having fun. You can see in one case, in uh, the sort of third middle row, they added a halo around, um, just because I think he got slightly bored at that point. Um, so I wanna, I wanna move on now briefly to uh, innovation and disruptive innovation, because I think it connects to a lot of the things that have been going, that have been discussed here. So by disruptive innovation, or innovation, so think in terms of Legos. How many things can you build from a bunch of parts? How many things can you build from a bunch of parts? So in this case, imagine you have 10 different types of Lego parts, and along the horizontal is different toys you can make. So that one um, design that has five parts, you can imagine that is the duck that we built. It's got five different parts, and it's one of the interesting toys you can make from this. And these are designs are all the interesting stuff you can make. The question we asked is, if you only have a few of those 10 colors, of those 10 components, how many things can you make? And which components do you want to add on so you can make more stuff? So um, as an aside, I'm a physicist, by the way. And I, I had to insert this slide because I think it shows how much um, physicists like tinkering. There is an actual paper about this. A physicist decided to put Legos in a washing machine and turn on the washing machine and then look at what sort of complexes, what, things are, what sort of things are spontaneously built. And these are some of the, the more popular things he got out of that. Um, coming back to, to uh, how many things can we build from parts, here we've, we're looking at how many things you can build from a set of letters. So we start off with two letters, A and B. In English, you can make seven words. So you add C, and the number of words you can, you can make goes up 57%. You add D, it goes up even more, 64%, 18 words. Now you add E, there's a threefold, so a 211% increase in the number of things you can build. So E has a much bigger impact it's that, ease that fifth Lego block that allows us to expand our design space in a really disruptive way. Here's the sort of plot of how many words you can make as you discover more and more letters, all the way up to about 100,000 for English. Now, similarly, you could do this Legos, you could do this with words, you could do it with recipes. So imagine, and we've, we found this database of the, studied by others, for other reasons, of 50,000 recipes made from a total of 380 ingredients. Now the question I have for you is, you've got in your kitchen some small number of these ingredients. How many different recipes can you make? So this is what that curve looks like. So along the bottom, it's how many, how many ingredients you have in your kitchen, randomly selected from the store, and along the along the vertical is how many recipes out of the total 50,000 you can make. Now, what's surprising here is that some of these ingredients are, are, um, are sustaining and some are disruptive. 
And what do I mean by that? Some ingredients, you add them to your kitchen and you can't do much more, like parsley. You add other ingredients to your kitchen, like garlic or onion, and suddenly there's a big expansion and the recipes in that, in that 50,000 page recipe book you can build. And so every time you add an ingredient to your kitchen, you can make more stuff. Well, this plot shows, so look at, say, the blue top curve, that is uh, onion. That shows the sort of, the, the percentage increase in recipes you can make as you, add it, uh, as you add it to your kitchen at any given point, as you expand the number of recipes you have. So what it's saying is that certain, certain building blocks, certain components, certain Legos or letters, or in this case, recipes, are glue-like. They allow us to combine other complexes or components in new ways. And in a sense, you can think of, of these as serendipitous innovations or serendipitous components, because their true value isn't realized as soon as we adopt them, but their true value keeps on, on showing uh, into the future as we add more and more components. And it, these, it, it's these serendipitous innovations that I think are, are very exciting and allow us to, um, to innovate in that broad sense of the word, including technologically. So here gives an idea, this is our sort of plot of innovative, or sorry, rather serendipitous ingredients. And without going into detail, along the x-axis is the, the true sort of value of the ingredient and along the y, the, so the, um, the, hor the horizontal axis is, is how much it's undervalued until, you, until later on. So you see here that um, things like basil, tomato, pepper, they, their true value kicks in only later on and it's those ones that we should, we should adopt early because they allow us to increase our design space. Um, so I'm going to stop and summarize there. There are two things um, I mentioned uh, which are related. One is about collective creativity. The other is disruptive innovations. I think that the idea of, of, a, of a collective or emerging creativity is, is exciting because for a long time we have been limited in, in our creative potential by, mostly by the individual mind. So most you know, mathematical proofs are done by one or two or three people. Um, most great you know, works of, of, of literature, putting aside things like the oral poems, are created usually by one person. Could we imagine a time when you have anonymously tens of thousands of people creating something real time? I'm a scientist and I think it's, it'll happen soon that somebody will submit a paper to Nature, a famous journal, and instead of saying author list, it'll say, see the edit history, 10,000 people proved this theorem. And if that's the case, maybe it will come, will come to a point where it's more important to ask the right questions than it is to search individually for their answers. And then on disruptive innovation, um, it seems that in, in innovation, a few things are glue-like and bring together, allow us to put together other components in new ways. And some of those we don't recognize early on, or we tend not to, and we should try to identify them because they're serendipitous. They keep on giving into the future. Thanks. <clears throat>